a little pygmy rattlesnake lit me up like a freaking oh, barbecue. Wow. I felt like I thought I had to get better to die. It wow. feels like somebody takes a brand and iron to your foot and oh. somebody was taking a sledgehammer and going, boom, ooh. boom. Yeah, ooh, do, do it again. Ah, ooh, ah. ah. There you go. That's what it was. <laughs> it was exactly like that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> this is really good. Boy, this is a top notch podcast. You got, got all <laughs> now stuff that going you're on, on here. it. <laughs> and now that we're not going to be killed by bears, snakes, lions, or tigers. There you go. <laughs> Bear. Be respectful, be united, be strong. And, you, and look what happened. The entire state erupted. Mm -hmm. And the governor writer said, oh, you know what? That, that, Maybe not. No, no, I don't think so. We're going to put yeah, that back. Yeah, it's true. And that's what happened. When the people lead, the leaders will follow. Yes. Wow. We see that in so many different animals that have evolved to different things, from cold to warm to dry to wet. I mean, it, it's just incredible how animals can adapt. Wow. So when do I get my gills? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, is there a timeline on this? Is it like a few million years? Or... <laughs>
me. Did you know that a platypus lays eggs? I did not know that. Okay, That's not only do they lay eggs, mm -hmm. they incubate these eggs for 10 days, okay. and then they feed like a mammal, very young, through what is not a nipple, because platypuses don't have nipples. They just have secreting glands that releases milk onto their skin to feed their young. Is that not what a nipple is? No, it's not a nipple. Okay. It's not a nipple, wow. believe it or not. And they hunt by this thing called electrolocation. Okay. So it's basically not even their sight. It's they can pick up the muscle movement of their prey in their water. So they're basically oh. like eyes closed, like just <laughs> feeling their way. And the males on the edges of their legs have venomous spurs. Oh my gosh. So they're like, they're stacked. I know. They're going to squirt you from their glands. They're and, they're lay so an egg, and they're so cute. They're going to They're yeah. so cute. They are super Can cute. Can you believe that? Wasn't there a cartoon with... Oh no, that was otters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. I love that. Me too. Me too. Okay, well, I know that that animal inspired this episode, but this animal <laughs> might be my soulmate. And oh. it is called the pistol shrimp. Oh, boy. And it is as cool as it sounds, okay? He looks so, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you know how you always say my voice carries, but I'm really short? Yeah. Well, check this out. You think my voice carries? <laughs> It is the loud, technically, because of its, you know, a bunch of things, which I'm not going to get into because I'm not going to embarrass myself, but it is one of the loudest animals in the world. It's two what? centimeters long, okay, and it snaps its claw so rapidly that it creates this bubble, and when the bubble collapses, it creates a sonic blast louder than a conquered sonic boom. They've even interfered with the sonar of a bunch of ships in the a ocean. A shrimp? How big are a they? A shrimp. They're two centimeters long. What? Yes. <laughs> Check oh this God. out. That's not all. Not only is it one of the loudest things, but they are, the snap can produce sonoluminescence. So essentially like sound creating some kind of visual. They're the closest thing to the real life Hadouken so far described in nature. Not only is there a highway speed jet of water and deafening cavitation bubble produced, but the energies involved heat the water to frightening levels. Wow. They're cooking down there. When they have little, <laughs> little spaghetti making. <laughs> Where the claw snaps shut, it leaves behind a space that is high pressure ocean water rushes it to fill. The closing of its cavitation releases huge amounts of energy and immense pressure, heats it all the way up to temperatures of 4,800 degrees Celsius. Wow. This creates a plasma arc, releasing a flash of light seen on sensitive cameras and essentially a high pressure pulse of energy directly into the body of unsuspecting victims. Yeah, it definitely is. So like your who will win in a animal? fight, the pistol shrimp or the platypus? Stay tuned to find out. That's a great question. That's a question we can ask our expert. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to stick to the water. Okay. I have one for you. Okay. Now, before I say this word, I'd like to say that I, I, as somebody who majored in English and had a minor or a focus in linguistics, I find it very interesting to try to learn uh, the correct pronunciation. So a lot of us call this adorable little animal uh -huh. who some consider to be the Peter Pan of the animal kingdom, an axolotl. But it's actually a Nahuatl word, and the proper way to say it is axolotl. Oh, So it's not axolotl or ajolote, like some people say, because you can find them in Mexico and stuff. It's axolotl. Axolotl. So are they like the animals that get BBLs in neighbor? No. Because they have a lash of ash? No. <laughs> no no <laughs> no but i'll tell you why they consider some consider this the peter pan of the animal kingdom okay the ashaloch can regenerate lost limbs including spinal cords and parts of a tart with no scarring it retains a lot of its juvenile features so if you look at they have those cute little baby faces they literally have <laughs> eternal baby smiling. faces it's so cute because it'll retain these features throughout its entire life unfortunately as adorable as they are they are critically endangered Oh, yeah. Ashanosh. Yeah. That's terrible. I know. I know. They're really cute. Man, we have a little bit something to learn from them. Lots. How are they Lots. doing that? I'm sure everybody's going to want trying, their they're snatch studying skin many and many regrowing limbs. Exactly. That's very cool. Very, very cool. You know what else is cool? Okay. The wood frog. Oh, the wood frog spends seven months of the year frozen. That's like wow. me. I'm always cold. These remarkable local amphibians are able to withstand the freeze and thaw cycle of our Midwestern winters, baffling biologists for years. It's able to freeze up to 60% of its body. They don't breathe, their heart stops, and their blood doesn't flow. Mm. Now, how do they survive, you ask? They can survive these conditions for months without eating or releasing waste. Why huh. do they do it? They are holding their pee. 
Now, si- this is <laughs> scientist. <laughs> same girl. Scientist from Miami University of Ohio. Let me just unpack that. Miami University of Ohio, Posers. not the University of Miami. <laughs> Make sure you know. Well, there's a Miami in Ohio. Anyway. I know. All right. They discovered that the urea from wood frogs urine is able to be recycled throughout their body. During huh. the hibernation, cy- bleh, cryoprotectants inside the frog's bodies act like an, anti- like an antifreeze, preventing ice crystals from forming inside their cells by lowering the body's freezing point, keeping their cells and tissues intact. Wow. Isn't that awesome? It is awesome, but you know what's more awesome than a wood frog? <laughs> and a, a little bit of a competitor to the wood frog's awesomeness? What's that? The tardigrade. I don't know saying. Let me tell I don't, you. I don't know her. I don't know her. Allow me you know, to oh, introduce you. Oh, my God. You guys Google that. It the, looks like a... <laughs> it looks like a... These are the microscopic water bears, or some refer to them as oh. moss piglets. They're very, very small, like half of a millimeter. We very hard even, to we see. We can't see them. They're like, no... Some of the larger ones, they're like at the edge of the eye's visibility, but they're also see-through. So these, most of these images are colored, so you would still need a microscope to really look at them. Oh, my God. To start, the tardigrades are their own phylum. So you know how we learned in the like, taxonomic sequence, kingdom phylum class, uh-huh. order, family, genus, species, and uh-huh. like phylum being like anthropods, like insects or vertebrates. Tardigrades are their own phylum. Sure, I remembered all that. I knew, I knew all that. No? Okay. Yep. They can survive... <laughs> Pretty much anything. Pretty mm. much anything. Okay. Except take, a shoe. Take this water frogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. No, I'll get there. They go into a, a process called cryptobiosis, where they can endure environmental stress, suspend their metabolism. So their metabolism slows to 0.01% of wow. their normal rate, and their water, it's, uh, their water consumption drops to 1%. They replace the water in their cells with protective sugars, and they go into this death curl called the tun, oh. or the tun. The tun. They, they've discovered a, water, a tardigrade that was in the ton phase for 30 years. What? But they normally, without going into these processes, live two and a half years. They can handle pressure up to 600 megapascals. And to give you a little bit of a comparison, at 300 megapascals, we kill most life and bacteria. Oh. It's also the first animal to survive in outer space. Oh. And they can survive a thousand times radiation more than a human. Pop Take off. that water frog. Pop, pop off, tiny. <laughs> There's space enough for all of them. P- tiny little bears. They look How like cute. Are they? they look like somehow mechanic. Like so, th- you know what? It's funny. Tiny little mechanical. <laughs> they're actually manatees. mostly a head. Like they're mostly just a head, and then the things holding up the head. Same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. I have one more. How, can we do one more? Yeah, please do. All right. And this one is not like a tardablunga lina blamba. It's a normal name. Okay. But it's very cool. <clears throat> the clownfish. Oh, Nemo. plot twist. The plot twist, but you know why? Clownfish can change sex from male to female wow. to ensure that a group of fish can continue to reproduce. Though clownfish are not the only animals that can change sex, they are unique in that this behavior follows social cues rather than being predetermined by age or size. Clownfish live in groups among sea anemones. Groups consist of one breeding male, and one breeding anemone. female, <laughs> and several smaller fish that are not sexually mature. If the breeding female dies, her male mate changes sex and takes her place, while another male in the group rapidly gains size and takes over the role of the breeding male. Look at that. Isn't that very interesting? That's really cool. It's like papaya trees. Papaya trees oh, yeah. can be hermaphroditic, yeah. You yeah. can actually like trigger that response in them by like bringing them very close to death, and they're like, oh no, gotta reproduce. Now I'm, now I'm a hermaphrodite. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh my gosh, look at that. Clownfish. <laughs> How cute. I think it's about time that we welcome our very esteemed guest, Mr. Ron McGill, a true legend in wildlife advocacy and conservation with over 42 years of dedicated service at Zoo Miami. Yeah. Ron has not only become a beloved figure in the community, and we all know that, but also is an Emmy winning documentary filmmaker. His work has played a pivotal role in raising awareness about endangered species and the importance of preserving local ecosystems. As a passionate advocate, Ron's efforts extend beyond the screen, inspiring countless individuals to appreciate and protect our planet's biodiversity. Join us in welcoming the incredible Ron McGill. My goodness, I I don't know how to take that. (laughs) I I like that guy. Who is that guy? (laughs) Sounds like a nice guy. 
this guy. <laughs> He's a great guy. What a privilege it is to be here with you two beautiful young ladies. This Aww. is really, I mean, I, I'm telling you, the trip out here in the space, yeah. Magical. You're doing okay with Use your energy? I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. Because I feel lighter. I've got this little, I'm trying to lose a few pounds and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm there. <laughs> well, beautiful. you look incredible in your it's space beautiful. suit. Well, thank you. This is custom deluxe space suit. Yes. We got you a custom space suit because you deserve it and you need it in here. Your skin melts off. <laughs> I, I was really amazed when I said, I, I told your producer, I said, there's no way you're going to find a space suit to fit. We're having one custom made send us the measurements. So get over here. <laughs> boom. I got in the thing. I looked in the mirror. I go, Bam! <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank you, ladies. No. I'm so moved by this. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. It's really a treat for us. Not only do we love animals, but we love people who love animals and dedicate their lives to animals in the way that you have. So yeah. it means a lot. And if you're out there, trust me, this is a treat. This guy is super cool, super knowledgeable. <laughs> yeah. And go listen to his TED Talk. You won't regret it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that one really moved me. Quasi? Quasi the lion. That's a true story. That moved me too. I mean, that's Oof. why I, I did it. I mean, I couldn't believe I was experiencing that. There's just so much we can learn from animals if we watch them. And I learned a lot from them. You know, I know and like I said, I'm preaching the choir. You guys are animal, your parents. I remember going to your parents' house to look at the wallabies. Oh, yeah. Wow, really? I, that's I remember incredible. that long, way back, yeah, when they had the wallabies back there. So it was wow. really... Their pool is still there. It's just <laughs> yeah. now for the dogs and <laughs> right. the babies and whatever <laughs> animal wanders I know. I remember, I remember learning about them because of your mom. Yeah. So we want to hear, we know that you're also an incredible photographer, mm. which is something that, like you just mentioned, when you observe animals, I'm sure when you're taking photos of them, you have to be very patient. Um, you know, it's easy to be patient with animals for me. Uh, listen, I, I'm not an incredible photographer. I just get to go to incredible places where you'd have to be really bad to take a bad picture. <laughs> um, it re really is. Working with this wildlife, I've been able to travel around the world and see animals in different positions doing different things that constantly teach me. Now, I've been at the zoo now 45 years. Wow. Okay. And every day I still learn something new. Whether it's at the zoo or whether I'm traveling, I just got back from Southern Africa and I mean, saw things again that amazed. I've been to Africa 54 times wow. and every time something new happens, every time you get back and you just go, my goodness, it th I wish the whole world can see this stuff. You know, when we talk about people wanting to care about animals, want to protect animals, if I could take everybody by the hand for five minutes and just bring them to these places I've been able to see, God, we wouldn't have any challenges at all. I mean, people would just, they'd be blown away. Wow. Is there a particular experience that's, is like one of your favorites or? Well, you know, I've had so many different experiences. I think for me, one of the most moving times was when I went to Rwanda for the first time to see the mountain gorillas. Mm. And, I, you know, I had watched this. I grew up in a small apartment, the son of Cuban immigrants in a small apartment in New York. Mm -hmm. And I watched in a little black and white television set, the National Geographic special with Diane Fossey mm -hmm. and the mountain gorillas. And I said to myself as a little boy, I said, gosh, what, what would it be like to really see that one day? And I remember the first time I got there and I'm on the mountainside and the biggest mountain gorilla at the time, his name was Gahunda. Mm -hmm. We found him and I'm photographing him and he sees me photographing him and he comes up and he sits like literally 10 feet away from me and he's looking at me, this massive animal, 400 oh. to 500 pounds. And he's just looking at me gently, and then a young male came and sat right next to me. Now, with the mountain gorillas, wow. you're not supposed to get within 15 feet of them. But if they come to you, you're not supposed to move. You don't turn your back and move. You just stay still and look down. Don't make eye contact because it's a threat to the gorillas. So I just sat there and I had a wide angle lens camera. I wish I'd brought the picture now. And I'm sitting there and this gorilla right next to me, he took his lips and he took my earlobe oh, and he wow. just tugged on it with his <gasps> lips. And I got the picture of, I took a oh, wide angle shot and I took this picture wow. of him right next to my face here like that. And it was one of those, you know, people say to you, they say, oh my God, weren't you scared? Weren't you afraid? I was so rocked. I was so moved by that. You know, my favorite saying in the world is, life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take. It's measured by the number of times your breath is taken away. Wow. And I got to tell you something. That was breathtaking. I sat there and I just went, <gasps> And I'll never forget that for as long as I live, I will never forget that moment when that gorilla, you know, supposedly this massive giant, you know, beast of an animal, gently took his lips and tugged at my earlobe and I just felt this in my ear. And then he just walked away. It's just, there's no way that you can put a price tag on something like that. No. Wow. What do you think he was doing? He's just curious. He's just curious, yeah. you know, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, the con those areas that have the mountain gorillas understand that that's their greatest economic engine. More people mm -hmm. go to see these gorillas. Wow. Now, I think to get a permit to spend one hour with the gorillas, assuming you find them climbing through the mountains, is between $1,500 and $2,000 wow. just to spend one hour with them. Wow. But when you're having people do that in a country that's so relatively poor, yeah. They understand, and that's why they're protecting these gorillas. That's why they make sure people behave themselves properly. Right. And that has shown the gorillas that humans are not a threat. Mm. You see, I, 
Listen, I was just there with, with, with lions. A lion walked right by me where he could have just jumped right onto me. I'm in a vehicle now. He could have just jumped right, but he, he walked without paying any attention at all. And that's, that's one of the messages I try to get across to people is that animals are not monsters. No. Animals are not mean. There's no such thing as a mean animal. There may have been an animal that was abused, mm -hmm. and because of that, it becomes defensive, it becomes aggressive, Absolutely. but they're not born mean. You know, we hear about all these things. Every time I see one of these broadcasts on television, alligator attack, shark attack, Oh. It's always the fault of the person, generally speaking. Mm, yeah. And even, I, I want you to use your common sense. If you're swimming in the ocean, think of all these shark attacks that you know get, get broadcast, right. right? What is it usually? One or two bites, right? Person gets out, bites bad. Right. Sometimes it's bad enough where you lose enough blood, somebody can, right, can die right. from it, okay? But understand this. Understand a shark. I've gone swimming with sharks many, many times. If a shark wanted to eat you, oh yeah, you would never have gotten out of the ocean. Yeah. What happens is the shark bites in murky water or you're splashing whatever. It's an instinctive thing. It bites, it goes, oh no, no, that's not what I wanted, okay, <laughs> and leaves. Yeah. Now you've got the bite, the person's bleeding. Sometimes that spurs on another bite. Right. But if that shark wanted to eat you, wanted to kill you, trust me, you would yeah. not have gotten out of the water. Oof. Same thing with alligators, mm. okay? Mm. Uh, many times we have these alligator bites, alligator attacks, and they're often, mistaken identity, people walking their small pets, mm. you know, along the lake or along the, the swamp area, and they're coming to get the pet. They're they don't, tempting them. They, they don't know it's Fido, they think it's a raccoon, a possum, oh, a duck, right. whatever the natural prey is. We just have to learn how to respect animals, mm. understand them better, and we won't have these conflicts. Wow. Yeah. So you swim with sharks too, you've been with lions, you've been with gorillas. I've been with gorillas, you know, I, I've walked, I've come across in Florida, now we're hearing the thing about bears. Every time there's a bear that shows up in the news, bear, everybody's panicking, get the people out, get the people out, get the <laughs> Bears want, no, especially here in Florida, they want nothing to do with you. I've come across probably four or five bears in my life <laughs> walking, walking in, in the forest. Wow. Up when I went to school at the University of Florida, so I used to go to Ocala National Forest a lot. And there's a pretty good population of bears there, mm. also in the Big Cypress Swamp. And I walk and I come across a bear. If you come across a Florida black bear, the worst thing you can do is turn and run. Never good do advice. that. Yeah. Remember Never that. Never, ever turn and run. Okay, you come across a Florida black put your hands up. Hey, bear. <laughs> hey, bear. Every time I've done that, the bear looks at me, pfft, runs away. Well, you, well, you know, Ryan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to remember that. When you put your arms up in the air, you're probably about nine feet tall. <laughs> when I put my arms up in the air, I'm gonna be bare food. No, and you no have you're not. You're not. Many scary encounters. Emily, we need to go to the casino. After Emily, this. Emily, you have great confidence. You speak with confidence. You have a very Good confident stance. That's all you need. Huh. That's hey, bear. The boom. It's Whoa, gone. Oh, wow. It's gone. Look at that. It's gone. It's gone. No, that it, is really good advice. That is really good advice. It's, it's really, good to know. It's really important to know that because these animals are not, and we're going to see more and more bears coming down now into southern Florida. Their population is starting to expand, and they're opportunists. You know, people yeah. need to learn to keep their garbage cans closed, put a, 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 a lock on the lid, and Ugh. don't leave your dog food out in the yard all night mm. long. Not only is that going to draw things like bears if they're around, but you got raccoons, you got coyotes now, a big True. situation. These are animals that are opportunistic. So yeah. if you're leaving your food out there, they're going to eat it. And plus, when you feed your dogs, you need to teach your dogs, listen, food time is right now. You got a half an hour. Oh, absolutely. Boom. And then pull it in. Agreed. And that's don't, it. Don't leave it out all night. We don't get do that. Edge. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -mm. That's all. I'm sorry. I'm talking too much, ladies. No, you uh, are not talking first too of all, much at all. You are probably saving some lives for real. <laughs> and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think I discovered that becoming a dog owner. I got my first dog when I was 20 because my mom, you know, busy, single mom, yeah. does not have time to raise two girls and a dog. Um, and it was just my illusion. I had my first apartment. And, I, and the, her name's Ocean. She's still with us. Mm. Oh. And she is a remarkable being. And the biggest lesson I think I've learned in being a dog parent because uh, just owner sounds so strange to me. It's yeah. like, I don't own you. I'm just happy to share life with you. Is that uh, probably not, I don't want to say nine out of 10. I'll say 19 out of 20 times. If you have an issue with a dog, it's usually the, the human. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely. not even a dog issue. It's a alpha, human issue. So, which we learned. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, me, knowing so much about these animals and meeting so many animals across your life, what would you say is the most misunderstood animal? Uh, ironically, something like an alligator. Mm. Yeah. I mean, people look at an alligator and they think it's this malicious monster. Oh my God, people see alligators, they're so screaming, it's going to kill you. And that's an animal that really wants nothing to do with you. <laughs> um, you know, they play an incredibly important role. Um, and, you know, and of course, snakes. I mean, people have such a phobia about snakes. I have a phobia of snakes. And it's just a misunderstanding. <sighs> people don't understand. I, here in Florida, we have a lot of different snakes. And I have yeah. people come across them all the time, racers and rat snakes and stuff. I promise you, there is no such thing as a snake that's ever going to chase you down. 
ever. True. And if a snake is coming your way, it's out of panic. And understand there's no snake. The fastest snake in the world is the black mamba. It's only found in Africa. It can maybe go about 12 miles an hour. A human can run about 20 miles an hour, oh, probably really? 30 or 40 with a big enough snake behind them. So you never <laughs> have to, to worry know. about the snake coming this way. I promise you, if you ever see a snake, just give it an opportunity to get away and it will go away. Huh. I, I give you my word. Okay. It's I, not going to come at you. Okay. So don't. If you see a snake, you can turn and run. It's not going to chase you. Yeah. You, you don't turn and run with carnivores, coyotes, dogs, bears, anything yeah. like that. You never turn your back and run. Why it's is that? Because their instinct is they're a predator. They're going to come after come you. After. If you have your pet dog and you go out in the yard with your pet dog and you start Our running dog. away from your dog, what right. are you, what's going to happen? They're going to chase, chase you. Chase you. It's Good. just an instinct. Yeah. Okay. It's an instinct that kicks in. So don't, don't ever do that with carnivores. But when you're talking about things like snakes, come on, they, they're not going to, they don't want anything to do with you. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you, listen, I've worked with snakes. Most of my life, my first job was at a place called the Miami Serpentarium, wow. working for Bill Haas. I didn't even know that okay. was a thing. That's oh, it awesome. was a thing. It was a huge thing. And, uh, you know, I was working with cobras and rattlesnakes. I never got bitten in my life. The only time I ever got bitten by a venomous snake, I was horseback riding, and I jumped off the horse and stepped on a little rattlesnake. Oh. A little pygmy rattlesnake lit me up like a freaking oh. barbecue. Wow. I felt like I thought I had to get better to die. It wow. feels like somebody takes a brand and iron to your foot, and oh. somebody was taking a sledgehammer and going, boom, ooh. boom. Yeah, ooh, do, do it again. Ah, ooh, ah. ah. There you go. That's what it was. <laughs> it was exactly like that. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good. <laughs> this is really good. Boy, this is a top notch podcast. You got, got all now stuff that going you're on, on here. <laughs> and now that we're not going to be killed by bears, snakes, lions, or tigers. There you go. <laughs> listen, Bear. Listen, here, 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 here's, here's, here's the lesson to learn. If you learn to properly respect an animal, you should never be in a position to be afraid of it. Mm. it it's the truth. You know, one of the things that, you know, when I, when I go out, my wife learned this with me. One of the animals I have the most profound respect and admiration for are elephants. Oh, me too. Oh, wow. When you get into the middle of a herd of elephants, you watch the interaction. And you'll like this because elephants are matriarchal. Yeah. Mm. The females run everything. And I find that most matriarchal societies are the most stable and best. Is it true that they stay? <laughs> Amen. Did you hear that? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they are. Did you hear that? <laughs> they, they are. They are. No, I'm, I'm, I, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. That's absolutely the truth. They're just the stable and best because they... Males serve a purpose to protect territory, Absolutely. you know, to, to plant the seed. But at the end of the day, females make males stupid, <laughs> okay? It's never the other way around. Mm. Never the other way. The, the females are always the ones that kind of keep things in line, keep things organized. And when you watch elephants, you've heard that term, it takes a village to raise a child? Yes. That comes from elephants. Mm, wow. When you watch how all the elephants, the ants, the sisters, they all were, I was privileged to watch an elephant being born in a wow. place called Amboseli. And I'll never forget watching the celebration, all these elephants just surround, and they're, ah, ah, oh. and this little baby comes out like a big, big oh. water balloon, flop, and everyone's, ah, everybody's so happy it's this huge celebration and if you can watch that and not say to yourself these animals are feeling this emotion yeah i think you're out of your minds this whole thing you know you hear this word anthropomorphic yeah fancy word for saying well we're giving human emotions to animals mm -hmm. who are we yeah. to say that we're the only ones that can feel love exactly. or fear that's such a self-centered egotistical approach to life yeah. i'm telling you animals feel all the emotions we feel sometimes that. they show them in different ways but they feel and many times they can sense those feelings in you better than sometimes your your, your mate does. Yeah, you know for sure. how many times you come on, you're not feeling with something. Your dog will come and just put his head on your lap oh, and yep. look at you, and just they know. They know. They know. Watch. I've watched dolphins with autistic children, nonverbal autistic children. Oh. And the dolphin seems to know. And you see the child makes wow. this connection. I've seen it with horses. Equestrian therapy is such a big thing with, with, with you know, troubled children, children I who get saw, abused. I've started learning about equestrian therapy. There's a woman in South Africa. Horses are amazing. What is They're that? They're amazing. They're amazing. I grew up with horses. You know, once we oh. moved down here to Florida, I, I had, we had our horses. And there's something about a horse. I mean, I, I love the smell of a horse, the yeah. smell of a barn. And there's something about it. You look, this big, powerful animal, but how they sense, they sense mm -hmm. you. They, they understand... I don't know. I mean, I, I know sometimes I'm probably an extremist in some of these things. I don't think no. so at all. But I'm telling you, animals are the greatest therapy you can have. Yes. You know, it's something to be said. You can be gone at work all day, and when you come home, that pet is going to be happy to see you. I know. Yep. That is just, it's a, that's a constant in your life. Yeah. No matter what. That pet seems to never have a bad day, and it's only made better when you're there. It's mm. insane. And it's, it, you know. Truly uh, unconditional love. It's unconditional I think they, love, they and, and animals, uh, for me, have been a guiding light, have been an inspiration. They've been just more than I could ever explain. Wow. Okay, well. <sighs>
He's incredible. I know. <laughs> I'm he's so awesome. Happy but he's here. right. And I feel like we turn off sometimes, we disconnect ourselves from that because of fear. People mm-hmm. are afraid of certain animals. Also, the way that we live now is so modern in the sense of you see a lizard in the house and you freak out, you know, instead of thinking, well, of course, like there are way more animals on this planet, you know. Listen, than I'll us. tell you a classic story. My father, Cuban man, I remember we were building a house out in the Redland, and all of a sudden, here, pa, shotgun, I go, oh, Dios mío, qué pasó? And I go, papi, qué pasó? Culebra. Oh my no. God! I go, papi, it was a little ring neck snake, this big. He oh. shot it with a twelve gauge shotgun. Oh my God! I go, papi, help me! I said, now that's not going to do anything. He goes, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> the only good snake is a dead snake. Oh, I go, papi, por favor! And it took me a while. But he finally came around and understood. And he told me one day, he said, Mijo, tu sabes, si, me siento mal. I feel bad Aww. that I that I had that feeling because I got him to finally hold a snake and understand. I said, doesn't that feel cool? Listen, the, the snake doesn't have nothing against you. Yeah. It's not going to hurt you. It's just a matter of understanding. It's so much about education and respect and trying to dispel a lot of the myths. I go, my father's from Cuba. There are no venomous snakes in Cuba. <laughs> I go, Bobby, no hay ningún culero en Cuba que te va a hacer daño. Yeah. No. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you, say it that way. you know, only good snake is that. It's, it's a myth. It's all these myths that perpetuate yeah, themselves from one generation to another. So I think now we're much more cognizant of wildlife, and hopefully we can pass that on to our parents and other generations. What do you yes. think is the greatest benefit of, an, of human beings interacting with animals? To understand them. Listen, we're all connected. This is going to sound really kind of, you know. You're this, we're the right no, audience. No, 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 we're right. the woo woos. We are the woo woos. Let me make a point clear. Whether it's the butterflies and the bees mm. that pollinate the plants that provide us with the food that we eat, understand that one out of every three bites of food you put in your mouth is directly connected to a pollinator. Wow. Okay? Whether it's the mangroves and the reefs that protect our shores and provide fisheries for us to eat, whether it's the rainforests that provide us with the medicines and the air that we breathe, even if we never see any of those things, by protecting those things, we're protecting ourselves. It's direct connection to our quality of life. That's why I get worried when I see the overdevelopment of things. I see people chopping yeah. down things to build buildings and build roads and stuff. We got to understand that all of this stuff is there's a balance, and we're all connected. We really are all connected. Now, I don't want to. I don't want people to get misinterpret. There's no single animal life that's more important than a human life. I don't want to come off as one of those because I think that's an extremism that's very dangerous. Mm. But we've got to take care of the people so they can take care of the animals, but at the same time, make them understand the animals. There's that old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught. Mm. So I think it's our obligation to teach people to understand wildlife and animals and learn to love them and want to protect them. Because again, by protecting them, we're protecting ourselves. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about what the importance of biodiversity? Absolutely. Listen, you know, when you talk about Okay, well, what's the connection? Like we hear now about the pythons, right? The pythons and oh, Everglades. Oh, in Everglades. It's mm-hmm. a huge, huge, huge issue. And I, I love wildlife, but you know what? They don't belong there. So we've got to take them out. Unfortunately, they have to be euthanized. People say, well, the pythons, what are they doing? Okay, so the rabbits and the raccoons are leaving, right? All right they're leaving. They're not becoming extinct. They're just moving out. But here's the problem. You have to understand the domino effect of how everything's connected. With the rabbits and the raccoons leaving, what you're now losing is a major seed disperser. Because mm. when the rabbits and the raccoons eat the grasses and the seeds, they right. go around, they poop them mm-hmm. out, and they're constantly planting. They're keeping that ecosystem constant. Right. Right? When you lose that, now you're losing that entire element. Mm. And now when those plants and, 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 and flowers or whatever, they're planting seeds from what they're eating are no longer growing, all of a sudden the insects that get the pollen from them are gone too. So now mm. you're losing the pollinator. It's a domino effect. And this is different than just like natural evolution, Absolutely. right? Because these, are, pe- these ma- are snakes that were being released in the Everglades. Right. Exactly. And that's another thing I want to say. You know, extinction is a natural process. Yeah. Look at many, the dinosaurs. Many, many animals became extinct way before man was on this earth. Yeah. The extinctions that concern us are man-made extinctions. Mm. Exactly. That are accelerating things at an unnatural rate. And that's what we got to be careful about. You know, how long did it take before certain elements of politics accepted climate change mm. and there's still some and who deny still, it I can't unbelievable. I know, it's unbelievable this is unbelievable uh, to me it is for years a we've third been of the arctic stuff. in 40 years listen i was in antarctica two years ago wow and i was watching i was watching these massive glaciers calve massive mm-hmm. pieces of ice folks 
we live in a place that is going to be so incredibly affected by climate change and sea level, oh, sea level rise. And we don't understand. What happens is we, we tend to be reactive. Instead of being proactive, proactive, we tend to be, we wait for the crap to hit the fan. Yeah. You know, and we got, got to listen to our youth. We've got to listen to science. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to stop listening. I know this podcast is on the internet. <laughs> but social media in many ways mm -hmm can be the toilet bowl of the internet. Yeah, I agree. Because true. there's no accountability it's there. It's true, it's true. Yeah. You know, and, and, and people need to be able to decipher between that noise mm -hmm. and what's really true. Yeah. And, and scientists, people working so hard that have done such great research, we've got to listen to that and be proactive and start using preventative measures instead of saying, okay, now, now, now what do we do? Yeah. It's too late for it's too late. And you're not getting your pickleball courts or your damn golf Thank you. Court. Yeah. Thank you. Oh Stay my away. Gosh. And that was another thing, you know, when they wanted to build a darn water park by the zoo. Oh Unbelievable. I went off the chain on that. And yeah. I like man, I got pop out because you know what happened was the director of the zoo said, You're forbidden from saying anything. Uh, and then no, the director of the park no. store said, You can't say anything. I said, you know what? You can tell me what I can say as Ron McGill from Zoo Miami, but you're not gonna tell me what I can say as Ron McGill, private yeah. citizen. <laughs> and I went out there and I made Work. that big net on the, on the and I, I I fully expected to get fired. And to be honest with you, I didn't think I didn't think it was going to make a difference. This was a done deal, multi-million dollar sign deal. But it was critical habitat. These are endangered species. Like, okay. I said, fire me, because I'd rather be fired and leave here with my head held high than wow. to bite my Work. tongue, bite my tongue and be a hypocrite because I was afraid of losing my job. I don't need a job that's going to make me do that. Yes. Well, they didn't fire me. And then what happened was when I went out, the public erupted. It was like everybody was feeling the same thing, but nobody, nobody was listening. We needed a leader. I, yeah. I, I wasn't a leader, but you know what? And this really bothers me. This bothers me, Jim. Let me tell you why. Because I am, a, I guess, a bit of a public figure. Yeah, absolutely. There were so many people that were saying all the things that I said way before him, but nobody was listening. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I said it, and they said, well, if Ron McGill's saying it, he's speaking against his employer. Leadership. Like well, well so, so now then the media covered it, and that opened the floodgates, and everybody came in. And when he won that thing, I'm going to tell you, I've been at the zoo 45 years. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in my entire life. Wow. career of working at the zoo was defeating that multi-million dollar project i drive it in the zoo now every day and i look at that place and i said thank <laughs> god well thank we god thank you yeah. and also in some ways that way social media helps because it did. like now with these parks and you know florida's trying to, or they were trying to get rid of so much protected land and god knows what that would have done and people got loud Oh, they got really got loud. They called me. They called scared. me right away. They said, we saw what you did with the water park in Miami. We want to follow that model. How did you do it? Yeah. I told them, I said, listen, you got to coordinate groups. You got to people yeah. be respectful, but be united. Don't start, you know, when people start calling people names and being just, no, that never works. No, there's no need for that. That never works. Be respectful, be united, be strong. And you, and look what happened. The entire state erupted. Mm -hmm. And the governor writer said, oh, you know what? That, Maybe not. not. <laughs> no, I don't think so. We're going to put yeah, that Yeah, it's true. And that's what happened. When the people lead... The leaders will follow. Yes. Wow. Look, listen to all these quotes. We should make a book of all these little one-liners that we've learned today. <laughs> okay, so... Mr. McGill. <laughs> no, uh, hello. The, the quote about following the thing you love and understand... In the end, you protect what you love, you love what you understand, and you understand what you're taught. Another one of my favorites is, life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take. It's measured by the number of times your the breath, breath is, is taken, taken away. away. Never that forget one that one. That one is incredible. No, that one I, I can't forget. <laughs> that one I can't forget. So you've worked in a zoo, like you said, 45 years. Yes. And we know, because of social media and other things, sometimes zoos get a bad rap. And I need to speak about that. Please do. <laughs> okay, let me tell you something. I didn't come to work at the zoo 45 years ago to work for an attraction. I'm going to say this for the record. In a perfect world. Please do. Here, speak to your people. In, in a perfect world, <laughs> we would not need any zoos. Yeah. I would never, ever support taking an animal out of the wild and put it on exhibit in a zoo unless it's the last ditch effort to save that individual animal's life or to save the species. Now, we've been able to do that. You look at animals like the California condor, yeah. the Arabian oryx, the black-footed ferret. Those animals would be extinct today hmm. were it not for zoos saving them and releasing them back to the wild. You go to the Grand Canyon today and you watch a California condor flying over the canyon, that's a California condor from a zoo. Right. Okay? That's, that. We save that species. That's the important thing zoos can do. And also, as a kid growing up, Son of Cuban immigrant in a small apartment in New York City, when I went to the Bronx Zoo, it planted a seed in me mm. because it provided windows into a world that I never would have an opportunity to see. Yeah. Most of us are never going to have the opportunity to go to Africa to see a giraffe walking across the plains, go to the Amazon to watch a jaguar in the rainforest, or the Arctic to see a polar bear. Yeah. By, by providing those windows, 
it, it's able to plant a seed in kids like me that grows into a passion to hopefully get them to want to protect these animals. But that can now, no longer be enough. Zoos have to put their money where their mouth is, and they have to start providing funding to protect animals in the wild where they belong. Because let me tell you something, if the zoo is the last place where we see animals, zoos have failed in what should be their number one priority, to protect animals in the wild, to provide the support for animals, to protect environments in the wild. I started, the thing I'm most proud of in my entire career is at the zoo now, there's this thing called the Ron McGill Conservation Endowment. I started it on my own, where I've been able to literally raise millions of dollars. Every year, I give away tens of thousands of dollars to wow. the Zoo Miami Foundation to just animals in the wild. Not a penny of that money can be spent at the zoo, I and then I that. provide scholarships for people who have dedicated a career to conservation for university wow. classes. That's and, and that's the thing I'm most proud of because, you know, at the end of the day, I said to myself, you know, when I retire, I don't want to be that guy who is just going on television with animals or doing Sao Gant or doing radio or something <laughs> like that. You know, I, I, I want, what's the legacy that I'm leaving? Mm. And that endowment is the legacy. That, that, because I could leave here today, drop dead, and that, that endowment is going to give tens of thousands of dollars every year in perpetuity for the rest of time. That's incredible. That's the way it was set up. And that's what zoos need to do. Zoos need to be that portal to provide that kind of support while inspiring people to care about animals in the wild. Zoos got to stop spending multi-millions of dollars on exhibits in their zoos yep. unless they're going to put a good portion of that money to protect those animals in the wild. It's a problem I had with my own zoo. I mean, I started that endowment because I got very disappointed in my own zoo. I think... Well, Maybe we can go in on this together. I want to do a zoo, but that's people that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can go, and there you can throw whatever you want. There you there. go. Absolutely. <laughs> I really, I, I really like you. I like you too, but I, I yeah, know. I her know. Little, but I there's know. something that's about okay. her. I don't know. He, he only likes me because he likes her. No, 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 not at all. You're, you're wonderful. You're I'm wonderful, kidding, I mean, I'm kidding, just, I'm kidding. We've I known know. each other a long time. It's, it's a cheese true. Spot. Tiene cheese spot. <laughs> cheese spot that I like. I it's like you and Blum, baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay, speaking of cheese spot, and, and I really would love to, I'm dying to hear more about some of the photos that you've taken, oh. but I have a very strange question for you. Ooh. We now know you have survived every encounter with every scary animal so again I want, i'm gonna rub I'm your gonna, head i'm gonna tell you, you my favorite your... one in a little while Ooh, Ooh, exciting okay so with all this knowledge that you have of all the animals all, all this amazing stuff that they're capable of doing if you could create an animal from three animals what would it be and what would you name it huh wow that's a great question that's an incredible question <laughs> I don't think I'm smart enough to answer yeah. it. Um, <laughs> I, I you can't say platypus, okay? That one's taken. No, 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 platypus, no. The three animals I would use, number one, the harpy eagle. Mm. The largest, most powerful bird of prey in the world. Got talons the size of grizzly bear claws. Wow. Beautiful crest, majestic animal. That would be number one, because I'd have wings and those talons. Then it would be a dolphin. Oh, wow. A dolphin, because this way I have the harpy eagle that can fly and a dolphin that can swim be underneath the water and this. you have the brains of the dolphin, right? And then last but not least, an elephant. Oh. Because of the knowledge of an elephant and because that trunk is such an amazing thing. You know there are over 40,000 muscles in the trunk of the elephant alone? There are 700 muscles in your entire body. Oh. There are 40,000 in the trunk of an elephant. Unbelievable. This is unbelievable stuff. Wow, incredible, okay? incredible. Yeah, elephant, harpy, eagle, and dolphin. I would call it the, I don't know. <laughs> well, I can't wait to meet the I don't know. It sounds... <laughs> Sounds remarkable. Terrifying. <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you. Wow. Okay. So, uh, God, if you're listening, get to work um, on oh, that animal. <laughs> I want to tell you my story, my, my favorite animal encounter of all time. Okay. okay. Ready? Ready. Okay. About 36, 37 years ago, I'm moving crocodiles. I'm a young guy. Moving them. Yeah, we had. A, I was doing something for a television commercial oh. with crocodiles. I'm a young guy. Young guys are not very sharp. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just being honest. You don't got to sell me on that. I, 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 I'm just, I'm, I'm being honest with you. We, we tend to think we know more than we know. We do overconfident, a little machismo. It's just, we're stupid. What a smart man. So, <laughs> so, 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 I got careless. Crocodile bit me really badly in the hand. Bad to where at least I had two other guys to jump on the crocodile so that he didn't take his head and rip my hand off. But we had to put a shovel in his mouth so I could get my hand out. Got my hand down and it's a mess. I got to go right to the hospital to have surgery, right? So, whoa, 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 I'm not in the hospital. And I get in the hospital and I have to have surgery on there. But 
you know, my father always told me there's a good reason for every bad thing that happens. Mm. And I said, Papi, oh yeah, un cocodrilo, me mordió, I'm on here, I'm a mess. And he goes, paciencia y fe, mijo, paciencia y fe. <laughs> so I was in, I have surgery, I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, okay, this is going to sound terrible. Please, this is, remember, I'm a young guy. Mm -hmm. I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you and transparent on what I was thinking. Love it. Okay? Typical stupid guy. So I'm thinking, okay, positive, perfect. I'm going to have a beautiful nurse in the middle of a white nurse's outfit come and take care of me. Yeah. This is going to be perfect. Not too bad. Yeah, you're yeah, like, great, good there's thing, the okay? positive. <laughs> there's the positive, right? So I'm sitting there. I'm fast asleep. Wake up. Oh, it's my nurse. It's a guy. Oh. Not only that, <laughs> he wakes me up. I go, what, 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 what? He goes, you have to take the sleeping pill. I go, I was asleep. Oh yeah. my. <laughs> He woke you up to take the sleeping uh, pill. Exactly. <laughs> I thought to my father, oh yeah, papi. Tu quiera, esto es un, I was so mad. Yeah. Yeah. Mijo, paciencia y fe. Paciencia y fe. Oh, so then they say, okay. So now after surgery, I'm in the hospital a couple of days. Now I got to go downstairs to get physical therapy. Oh. And they make me sit in, I got bitten in the hand, but they make me sit in a wheelchair to go down to the therapy. What? I go, I go, <laughs> I can walk. It was my hand. No, no. Gosh. Insurance says you got to sit in the wheelchair. <laughs> so I'm in this. Yeah, roll, Poofy little gown, yeah. you know, I'm trying to make sure nothing's going yeah, on. Right. They're really wheeling me down. I feel like an idiot. I got my hand up in the cast like this. And I'm in the physical therapy room. And the door opens. The most beautiful woman I've ever yeah. seen in my life. There you go. She walks in. And I got scared in the beginning. I thought, did I die and go to heaven? But uh. She looks like an angel. <laughs> oh. And she comes up to me. She goes, Hi. Oh, just like that. And she has beautiful eyes. She's in, she, she goes, hi, I want to be part of your therapy team. And I just went, thank you, God. <laughs> and then she would hold my hand and she'd start moving it and it hurt so oh. badly. But you didn't care. And she goes, does that hurt? And I go, no. Nope. <laughs> I said, I didn't want to let go of my hand. And then I married her a year later. Oh! Wow. And now I get physical therapy for free. Yeah. That's why you like gators so much. There you go. <laughs> Plus, I went to the University of Florida. Oh, right, that's right, right, right. There you go. Oh that's right. my God. So that's my favorite no, animal story. No use over here. Don't and worry. a lesson. There's a good reason for every bad thing that happens. Look at that. I like that. Me really, too. really, you should be thanking your dad then. Yeah, exactly. Your dad Paciencia and gators. Paciencia y fe, mijo. Paciencia y fe. Yeah. Paciencia y fe. Unbelievable. <laughs> so one time, speaking of animals, and you just said something really interesting that, well, you know, at some point, everything becomes like, extinct, right? It's probably right. going to happen to us within the next two to three years. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, things are going. I'm we'll moving see. with the animals. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, you saw SZA. She wore these prosthetics. And, and they're like, why are you wearing prosthetics? She's like, because I just... I don't want to be tired of being anything but a bug. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Preach, like, I feel so you, girl. I'm ready to be a bug. Preach. But anyway, um, wow, I forgot my question now. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, so you talked about, yeah, everything becomes extinct. But in that same way, everything evolves as well in, in a myriad of different ways. Like I remember learning about butterflies that were living by this factory and they had to get used to the ash falling on their wings. So then they started changing colors over time and things like that. And I stay up at night sometimes because a teacher once told me that whales at one point had legs. Oh. Because I guess she said something about these bones near somewhere. That's, right. That's pelvis. true. Pelvis bones. So yes, we had also. whales at some point walking around this joint? Mm. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had that. <laughs> snakes had legs too. If you look at pythons. Oh, hell no. You look at the, they had a pelvis bone. Sure. Snakes evolved from lizards. People yeah. think it's the other way around, that they're primitive because they didn't have any legs. But no, snakes evolved from lizards. They lost their legs to be in the subterranean uh, you know, habitat that they live in. Wow. Whales were originally a terrestrial animal that slowly evolved to move to the ocean. So th we see that in so many different animals that have evolved to different things, for, from cold to warm to, to dry to wet. I mean, it, it's just incredible how animals can adapt. Wow. So when do I get my gills? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, is there a timeline on this? Is it like a few million years? Or? <laughs> you can Austin Powers your way there. But well, listen, <laughs> listen, we're evolving in our own ways. I mean, if you looked 200 years ago at human beings, your little toe is a lot smaller now than it used to be. Thank God, that would look weird. <laughs> it looks weird to you now, but those people 200 years ago would look at your foot and go, you look a little weird. Where's your little toe? <laughs> okay, we, we start evolving to lose certain things and evolve. Look how the human body has evolved. Look how we are breaking athletic records all the time. We're getting faster. We're getting taller. We're getting stronger. Yeah. This is all a part of a process of, of, of 
evolution, uh, you know, to, to whatever habitat you're in. Faster, taller, stronger ain't happening to me, Ron. <laughs> you were born you. in what, like 1841? I was born in 1994. Oye, what did she just tell me? Compared to que yo estoy viejo. I no, she said you are... Born in 1890-something exactly. is what she said. <laughs> That's what she said. She said, you are so beautiful, I am convinced you're a vampire. You, I and apologize. have traveled across multiple centuries well, to be. When we get up in good. space, that the air good. is thin. <laughs> I called good. Enrique Santo that's a good. fossil. That's good. That's he good. Called, repeatedly said I had a big head. Something happens when there's no God. Listen, <laughs> that gift that you have of, first of all, the gift of this. I, I've not experienced this Emily, <laughs> this, 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 is, this is a wonderful <laughs> gift. But I have watched you do what you do. And it's amazing. It really is. I don't. I don't mean to be, you know, patronizing. But it is amazing oh, what you do. It. And and what's really great is just the way you've, you just are who you are. You're not, you know, you come from a royal family, but you don't come yeah. off as some royal little princess. Thank you. And that's one of the best compliments I can give you. Um, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'll never forget the time you came to the zoo, <laughs> with your family, and we took them around. And this is when I fell in love with you, Emily. <laughs> She walks in and I and they ask everybody to ask. So, what was your favorite part of the zoo? You know, and her mom said, "Oh, feeding the giraffe." That's all I doing this. And then they asked Emily, "What's your favorite part of the zoo?" And you know what she said? What? She said Ron McGill. Oh, That's what she it's said. The truth. <laughs> because it's the truth. She said Ron McGill, and I said, "Love you." <laughs> amazing and i will never forget that for as long as i live that's the feather i keep in my cap forever <laughs> and you need to go experience it for yourself because it's pretty remarkable oh, honestly man. you know it's it's going to the zoo especially here in miami is a, one of the zoos that i would say you feel happy and privileged to be in when you're there as opposed to feeling bad for any kind of animal or anything like that you guys are extremely responsible and i can't think of anybody better to represent Checks in the mail, baby. So, oh, oh. <laughs> great. Thank you. We feel wow. very privileged that you came to join us privileged. today. Privileged. Yes, you guys absolutely. out there, please take this and feel it as a responsibility to go out there and connect more to animals and to learn more about them. Because just as Jen, Jen, who I don't know who that is, because this is Jem. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jen, okay. Just as Jem said, Scarlett as small as she was, really did change our life and open our mind to something new. So Completely. you don't want to, you don't want to end your life and still be okay with shooting a snake or stepping on a snail or hurting Absolutely. an animal. Oh, or, that's, that's like one. You know, that goes down as like one of the worst feelings in history when you get that crunch of uh, stepping on a snail. It's like. Uh, but um, I would take the responsibility of the fact that we have the privilege to be able to connect to animals in our lifetime very seriously. Yeah. And start doing more of it. Trust me, because uh, Jem can tell you that's something that's the most rewarding thing, I think. One yeah. of the most rewarding things. Absolutely. And I think and it broadens not only our relationship to animals is when we get to be exposed to them, but actually our relationship to each other because our definition of love just expands. So. Yeah. And when we're in a big cuddle puddle with, <laughs> with the dogs, <laughs> tell me that's not heaven. Yes. A cuddle One puddle. more wouldn't do anything, you know. What a great term, a cuddle puddle. Yeah. <laughs> No, knowing him, he'll cut a puddle with a lion. This is a picture of me spooning a lion. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, scary. Ron, before we deorbit and head back to Earth, there's one more in our own world tradition that we would like to bring you in on. Yep. It is the only Outer Space News Network that you're ever going to hear that's actually partially true, partially not true, but you never know because I'm just going to tell you it's true all the time. Space News! <laughs> I'm going to report it's the space. news in space. So the deal is, now that we've been super mean to you, we're going to be nice <laughs> by honoring you by dedicating space this week's space news to animal-themed news. Yeah. All right. So let's learn about this topic right now. Here we well, go. Well, I refuse to make eye contact with Iran for the rest of the episode. <laughs> All right, ladies, germs, germats, and everything in between. Believe it or not, many animals have been to space. An American <laughs> monkey named Albert II went into space on a B-2 in 1949 and a mouse in 1950. In the 60s, guinea pigs, frogs, cats, wasps, beetles, and chimpanzees followed. Animals in space are also a popular topic for children's books over the years, mm. attempting to make kids more excited about space. The only problem, the last page most often reads, and then most of them died from asphyxia or spontaneous combustion. Oh, Not God. the tardigrade. <laughs> Not the tardigrade. Next, <laughs> plants and animals are dying off at an unprecedented rate on Earth, as you heard from Ron. Some scientists are looking to outer space for a solution, claiming the lunar arc would preserve samples from animals and other organisms. Animals and other organisms have responded to this, saying, and I quote, Fuck the samples. If that's the case, send our asses to the moon to be preserved. 
I mean, they have a point. If they can preserve the samples up there, why wouldn't they just send the animals? Sorry, guys. I will we'll be getting back to you with a quote shortly. <laughs> All right. Lastly, for Space News Animal Edition. Ham, named after the Holloman Aerospace Medical Center, was a chimpanzee trained to perform tasks during space flight. Mm. He became a celebrity after his flight on January 31st, 1961. Ham learned to pull levers to receive banana pellets and also to avoid electric shocks. His fellow traveler Bacon, who was a pig, was Aww. not so lucky as he was sent up as breakfast for this 1961 crew. Whoa. Well, mm. What a great story to end on. <laughs> And this has been Space News! <laughs> well, Ron, how was your Don't first Space News? <laughs> That's all her. She's your favorite, right? <laughs> you said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for real. Thank you so much for being here. We Ladies, value you. We it has value your been time. a slice of heaven. Oh, Absolutely likewise. a slice well, of heaven. Well, you a tall drink of water. <laughs> uh, don't worry. I hope your wife can't hear me. Um, <laughs> look at the people and tell them what you got going on or any parting words that you have for our friends on Earth. Just remember, we've not inherited this earth from our parents. We're borrowing it from our children. Mm. Do what you can to preserve wildlife, preserve this wildlife, because it's directly connected to our quality of life. By protecting it, we're protecting ourselves. I could have said it better myself. Follow us on socials at In Our Own World Pod, and we'll see you next week for another exciting flight. Love ya! Bye! <laughs> <laughs>